Hey everyone, Mano back here, and today we're showing you how to solo the Prophecy Dungeon, this time on a Titan. I had previously made a video for Warlock and Hunters, and many, many people were asking for a Titan build, and so, as promised, I'm delivering on that today. And we'll be using no raid weapons or anything else like that. This is all weapons and armor that can be found very easily within Destiny 2. I am going to be using Taken Spec on my weapons. And just a quick reminder for those people who did not watch the previous video, Taken Spec does work in the Prophecy Dungeon. In fact, it works everywhere in Destiny 2 where there are Taken enemies. However, the armor mods from the Last Wish raid do not work here. So if you want to use Taken Spec, it is totally okay on your weapons. It's going to give you a plus about 10% buff on your weapon damage. If you use boss spec or major spec or minor spec, it's actually plus 8%. It's only a small, tiny margin of difference. And for those folks who don't have it, two options. You should use boss spec for any of the boss damage sections, and then you should use minor spec on any of the other sections so that you can do more damage with your weapons. But if you want to get taken spec, it is free. You do not have to do any encounters in the last wish raid. So due to popular demand, I'm going to show you how to get those chests. And if you want to skip ahead to just the prophecy solo dungeons, just check the timestamp right meow. All right, first thing, Jabronis, if you've got Destiny 2 Forsaken, you can load into the Last Wish Raid. We're going to show you how to get to the Wall of Wishes really quickly. Just make your way over to the first encounter. It's just a small jumping puzzle. And then hop over to this platform here. You're going to see a bunch of little ledges that have plants on top of them. Just basically jump on top and follow them and go up through this small crawl space and you will be at the Wall of Wishes. You can input two wishes that will help you get to the chests in the last wish raid. All you have to do is shoot them with a weapon and they will show a different symbol on the screen. By inputting different codes, you can teleport to different portions of the last wish raid. Input the code that you see here on screen and then stand on the plate. That will teleport you to this location, which is the opening of the Shurochi encounter. This chest is over in that direction underneath one of the bridges. Now we're basically going backwards in the last wish raid, but it's very, very easy to get to. In fact, many people have called these chests free loot in the past, and they basically are. All you have to do is jump back across and you'll get loot from the last wish raid. If you get any of the chests, you also have a chance to get one of the five taken mods. Now, if it's an armor mod like armaments, invigoration, barrier, or repurposing, it won't be able to be put on your weapons or work outside of the last wish raid, but the taken spec mod will actually work on all weapons anywhere against taken anywhere in destiny 2. Once you pick up the chest, you have a chance to get a piece of armor, weapons, or one of the taken mods. Okay, so that was the first chest that we just got on screen. We're going to show you how to get to the second chest. It's a little bit trickier, but go back to the Wall of Wishes and input the code that you see here on screen so we can jump ahead to the Morgeth Ogre encounter. So what you're going to do here is you are going to fly backwards through this area. Now on Titan and Warlock, this is actually very easy to do. On a Titan, all you need to do is sword fly. If you don't know what that is, Put on Lion Rampants on your Titan and then put on Catapult Lift. What you're going to do is jump up with Catapult Lift. It will raise you up very high and take a couple of sword swings, two or three if you can manage it, and then reactivate your jump. It will allow you to basically sword fly infinitely. If you're on your Thunder Crash, you can also just fly a little bit, but it will drive you down. So just be careful when you decide to activate your super. And if you're really good, you can sword fly really high like wrinkle on screen there. Jump ahead and find this tree location out here. Jump up on top of the tree and then jump up on top of this platform. There will be a chest off in the distance that you can actually pick up. This is the second chest. As a warlock, it's even easier. Just use top tree dawn blade and charge a grenade that will activate heat rises. And you will get two dashes and basically be able to jump across without losing any height. As soon as the cooldown goes away, go ahead and dash two more times. When you get bored, you can just pop your super and just fly across. Don't spam your jump. Just do a jump maybe every second or so. And you should be easily able to get across without even wasting all of your super or another grenade. 
Hunters, unfortunately, there is not a way for you to go over there solo. If you've got a friend, though, you can actually have them go over on their Titan or their Warlock, and they'll go back to the area here in the first Spire. This is right after the Shirochi encounter. Have them go up the staircase, and as soon as you join them, instead of actually spawning on the far side bridge where we originally spawned, They'll actually spawn in right down here by this tree, and then they'll be able to proceed to the chest. By the way, all this footage was captured over at my live streams at twitch.tv slash madodestra, where I help people get things done inside of Destiny 2, from raids to grandmasters to PvE, exotic helps, and more. All right, my fellow crayon eaters, it is time to talk Titan builds. As always, the suggestions that I'm going to be making are recommendations. They are not requirements. In fact, I encourage you to experiment with some different builds and some different armor pieces and check out what you can do with those things and see how they synergize. That will help make you a better player by getting to know more about your classes and the weapons and how they all synergize together. So next up, let's talk about weapons. We're using Ignition Code Grenade Launcher. It's a blinding grenade launcher that works really well. It's easily farmable right now. As long as you have the season passes, you can go to the prismatic recaster and easily farm that. Same thing with the Fractathist shotgun. Again, not a requirement, but I'm going to be using that as well as my workhorse sniper rifle, the long shadow. This is just a world drop weapon. You can get this from Zur, the gunsmith, random drops from all over. Very, very easy to get. Next up, we have Trinity Ghoul. I'm going to be using this to deal with a lot of the ads in the experience of the Prophecy Dungeon, as well as you could use Risk Runner. I do find that for me on a Titan, Trinity Ghoul works just a little bit better in dealing with the ads. Now, some people in the comments section actually suggested using Agar Scepter, and you're right, it might be amazing to use to deal with the ads, but I don't have any video of that currently. So if you've got that weapon and you want to experiment, try that out. Let me know down in the comments section if you use that build and what you thought of it. Next up for heavy weapons, we're going to be using Falling Guillotine. If you go right now to the gunsmith and you don't have a god roll, you can get a 9 out of 10 roll on Falling Guillotine from the gunsmith right now. It's a very, very, very strong roll. It's not perfect 10 out of 10, but it is almost as good. And if you don't have it, you definitely want to have it. It is one of the best swords in the game. You certainly could use Lament, but it does take an exotic slot, whereas you wouldn't be able to use Trinity Ghoul and Lament together. So I find that this combination, especially for the first encounter, works better. But again, I encourage you to experiment as much as possible. I'm going to be using Sleeper Simulant on the final boss. But if you do have 1k voices, 1000 voices from the Last Wish Raid, you certainly could use that and do a lot of damage. That is up to you. But again, I am keeping this as the easily accessible gear. So we're going to be using Sleeper Simulant during that encounter. All right, let's talk armor next. Pretty much everything that you want to have is going to have some kind of version of charged up, taking charge, and then high energy fire or lucent blade. So these are all mods that you can pick up from the gunsmith or Ada one. Very easy to get. You just want to make sure that you check in with them. And if you have them already, great. You can certainly experiment with some different builds, but I find that these help to boost the damage in certain encounters. And then really the only exotic that I'm going to main is Toon Marchers because of the fact that not only will it increase sprint speed, but sprinting will build up a static charge after melee attacking an enemy. That charge will chain damage to nearby enemies. So really for my eye clear, I'm not going to use weapons so much as I'm going to use my Toon Marchers and run around and punch things and having that melee damage and lightning spread to all the different characters. I don't think there's a more Titan build that we could possibly get. We're going to be using two main subclasses on our Titan. We're going to be using the Sunbreaker and the Sentinel Titan. I'm going to use Bottom Tree Sunbreaker because of the ability to create sunspots. So if you use a grenade, a melee ability, or any kind of super ability, you're going to leave a sunspot. And when you use those solar abilities, any of those kills that you get from those abilities will restore your health and leave a sunspot in their wake. We're going to use that together in the first portion of this, and we're going to go through that together. What's great about that, too, is that when you are standing in a sunspot, you'll be able to throw your hammers faster. 
When you pass through a sunspot, you recharge your melee and grenade abilities faster and your super lasts longer. It also increases the damage the weapons that you deal, and you'll see that in the first boss encounter. You can also use this to strike an enemy with a melee ability and it will release a solar explosion. Pair that together with our Dune Marchers and that will be fire and lightning. A very, very cool combination. All right, enough prep. Let's actually get into the dungeon itself. Here's a quick refresher for those people who've never done the Prophecy dungeon before. The main mechanic that progresses all of the different experiences is the dark and light motes. When you kill the Taken Knights, they will drop three motes a piece and you need to collect five of light or dark motes. How do you know which motes you're going to get? Well, if you look on screen right now, when I go through the sniper, do you see that there's a light effect at the bottom? That means that when I kill the Taken Knights, they will drop light motes. When I'm standing in the shadows, it will actually give me a darkness effect and it will actually create dark motes when I kill the Taken Knights. When you pick up five motes, you will get a big giant moat and it will say light or dark motes max. You then use that on the light or dark columns respectively, and that will allow you to progress through the encounters, whether that's removing an immune shield or progressing and opening these doors that are in front of you. Now, not everyone likes to do this portion of the encounter, so we'll show you how to skip these as well on all characters. If you decide to skip the encounter, I do recommend that you have whatever heavy weapon you are planning to use, whether that's the Salvation's Grip grenade launcher or a sword, and you go to a public space, probably a patrol area, and pick up a flag so you'll have full sword or grenade launcher ammo. Then you can go ahead and load into the Prophecy Dungeon and you will have full heavy ammo when you go in. For the Sparrow Skip, you're going to step up on the first globe, take a jump, and swipe a couple of times. You're going to take a small little mini jump. As soon as you do that, take out your sparrow as quickly as you can and then pull back on your joystick or push backwards on your keyboard. By doing that, that will get your sparrow to move forward and you'll need to get enough momentum to go forward through that. It takes a couple of practice runs to get it right. I'm going to show you the Salvation's Grip skip on my Titan, but you can do this on a Hunter as well. In place of Lion Rampants, just use Stompies if you've got that. And what you're going to do is use a charge shot and make a stasis grenade ice platform that you can just jump onto. It is a little bit tricky and it is a little bit dark when you do this. You just need to be very, very careful as you move up. It's a little bit hard to see, but you should be able to move up really quickly if you get used to doing this. I had to take a couple of different tries to build all the platforms that I needed to do to get up there. But once you get used to it and you know what's coming, you'll be in good shape. And finally, since I didn't show it in the Warlock video, I'll show it in this one. You can use Heat Rises with Top Tree Dawnblade. Hug one of the two sides of this tube and you will basically just lift right up to the top. It's very simple. Once you figure out how to do it, it's very, very easy. Since this is the Titan solo video, let's show you how to do it really easily. Put on Catapult Lift use Lion Rampants, and what you're going to do is Sword Swipe seven or eight times, activate Catapult Lift, and repeat the process up until you get to the top. This is probably the easiest way for Titans to do this. You do need to be careful when you are up near the top because sometimes it can make it so the sword doesn't swipe. In any case, you need to make sure that you get up to the main platform to spin the rings for the first main encounter. If you don't get that respawn restricted and you die, you'll actually soft lock the encounter. So make sure you get to that area before you start the next phase, which is the Taken Phalanx. The Taken Phalanx is the first real encounter of the Prophecy Dungeon. There's going to be a boss with an immune shield, a bunch of Taken Knights trying to kill you, as well as Taken Scions shooting at you all throughout this circular arena. But most importantly, there are going to be light and dark columns. What you need to do is maneuver around the circular arena in the light and dark areas, kill the knights so you can pick up the moats and get rid of those columns of light and dark. The big challenge of this is the fact that all of the enemies are very aggressive and will chase you around this small confined arena. The main damage dealing weapon I'm going to be using is the Falling Guillotine, but I'll also use it on the Knights so that I can get the motes that I like, as well as being able to use the Passive Guard mod from this season's artifact. That will help me stay alive because there are many times as a Titan where you can die if you're not paying attention. For example, Warlocks could just proc Devour and then kill a bunch of enemies and continue to get their life back. Hunters could just go invisible 
basically infinitely as long as they had melee energy or dodge energy. Titans are a little bit different. They have to be on the move. There's no way for them to instantly get their life back. There are some ways to do that with the Sun Warrior build. So, for example, you see these enemies here. I'm going to get a punch back. And as long as I kill someone with my melee, I'll be able to make those sunspots and regenerate my health. Unfortunately, the only way for me to get my life back is to actually get a kill with a solar ability. So that's grenades, melees, and hammers. In a pinch, you can pop your super if you are absolutely going to die. It's kind of an insurance card, but we want to try and save our super for damage on the boss. If ads continue to spawn up and you need to deal with them, just hit a couple of them with the Trinity Ghoul and you'll be able to knock them out very easily. You don't even have to actually shoot directly at them. You do have to kill one with a shot, uh, but once that happens, you can proc Lightning Rod and move on from there. Once you extinguish all the light and dark columns, the barrier will collapse on the boss and you can do damage. If you position him correctly within all of those sunspots, you can knock out his health really quickly. You can also see that I'm charged with light. I'm going to build up Whirlwind Blade with my Falling Guillotine. See that it says Keened right now. I can continue doing damage on him and do massive damage. Now, what will happen is after a certain period of time, some of these taken hobgoblins will come up and they will actually try to shield him that's actually okay we want to continue to pick up orbs of light and power so that we can continue to be charged with light and i can continue doing damage you can see his health almost goes away altogether in one shot now i'm going to be safe usually if you're going solo you want to do a one phase just to be safe if you really want to push it to the limit you can try and go for a one phase but again if you're going for solo flawless Air on the side of caution. There's really no reason to push it. You can just rinse and repeat until you're done and ready to do damage again. All right, some of you might be asking, Mano, why don't I recommend you using a bubble? Now, if you can use a bubble in this encounter, that's great. But when I tried to do it together like this, I found that more often than not, he'd move out of the bubble. I would hit his shield. I would not be able to do as much damage with the bubble. And basically, it was better to get the charge with light piece as well as the keened blade together. And it would do more damage along with the sunspots, along with the increased survivability of being able to melee things on a more consistent basis. I just found that bubble wasn't the play for me. If you find it to be really solid for your strategy, you go right ahead and use it. But for me, I'm using bottom tree sunbreaker. A couple of final suggestions as we leave this encounter. As a Titan, it is even more important that before you go for all the columns of light and dark, that you get your health back. Those knights are very, very accurate with their shots, and they can kill you when you go up to or when you're getting out of those columns of light. So just be careful. Don't try and go up there with very little life as you can die very, very easily from the boss or the knights. Just take your time. Be safe and you can knock them out pretty darn quickly. Usually it will be a two phase. Once you get all done with that, you will be rewarded with either armor pieces or the judgment hand cannon or the long walk sniper rifle. All right, final thing before we go, which is a cool little trick that I have shown on stream before. I can actually knock out two columns at the same time with one singular moat. Basically, all you need to do is jump equidistant between two of the columns that are equal, so too light or too dark, activate the moat in between the two, and if you're really lucky and well-positioned, you can get two columns taken care of at the same time. You can do this on Hunter, Warlock, and Titan. You just have to make sure that your position is accurate and you're good to go. All right, let's move on to the next encounter, which is the Heaven Hell area. If you've got the Black Talon Sword, I would make sure that you have that equipped as well as a sniper rifle for this particular portion of the dungeon. You're going to find yourself in a big desert or snowscape here in the wasteland. And what we're going to do is find the secret chest first. Take a hard left and find these formations over here and then follow them around. You're going to find a tower with some yellow dust in front of it. And there is going to be an invisible taken minotaur that is going to be guarding that entrance. So right here, you can see there's that yellow dust right there. You can see the taken minotaur over to the left-hand side who can kill you. So just be careful as you go on through and you will find the secret chest there. Once you've gotten the secret chest, you need to go to the main portion of the wasteland. 
you need to find where the Taken Blights are spawned up and you need to destroy the three Blights quickly before they kill you. Here's a cool trick. Stand on top of the Blights and you can damage them with whatever weapon you'd like. You do not take damage from the Blights, but you do take damage from the enemies down below. So you can see right here, I'm almost dead. I take a second, get out, reestablish my life and move on from there. Once all three Blights are down, look for the little circle of light that is going to be in the center of every area. That's actually Toland, and we'll refer to him as Toland from now on. And he's going to point you in the direction of the next set of Blights. What I recommend you do first when you're going into any of these Blight areas is to make sure that you snipe the Taken Goblins that are trying to snipe you. They can more often than not kill you, and I usually do this at a distance. A great opportunity for your sniper to show some love. Another cool trick is if you have a fully charged Black Talon, they will one-shot the Blights, which is one of the reasons why I recommend that you run it. As soon as you take out those snipers, if you've got sword ammo, really quickly just charge up your shot, run into the Blights, and dip. As soon as you've gotten all three done, rinse and repeat with all of the Blights, move on to the final location, and you're good. You'll do this a total of three times, three sets of three Blights. Make sure that you step into the Toland location every time to progress it. As soon as you do it for the final time, you'll see the way is open and you're good to go. If you're getting lost, all you need to do is keep rotating and find this long, tall wall here. Toland will be at the staircase of the area you need to move into. Next up, we've got the Hexahedron, which is the second main encounter. I'm going to be using a slightly different build here. I'm going to be using the Middle Tree Sentinel Titanal here. Now, if you're comfortable actually using the bottom Sunbreaker, you certainly can. But I like running this because the Code of the Commander gives you a lot of life regeneration abilities that weren't always afforded to you in the first encounter. So if you hit anything with Void abilities, it will basically stick Void Detonators on there. When they explode, they regain health and also give you Grenade and Melee Energy. So it's really nice if you need to stay alive in this encounter. Okay, I need to take some time to explain this encounter because there is a fundamental misunderstanding of how this encounter works in the community. I'm going to do a shorter version, which is very simple, broken down, don't have to think too much. And then I'm going to do a longer version, which explains all the little nuances. Because after even a year, most people in the community don't understand how this encounter works. So we're going to take care of that today. Here's the super short version. Toland, aka the little ball of light, is going to be up on either the ceiling or on the sides of the walls. He's going to be showing you which column of light or dark motes you need to deposit. Kill the snipers that are trying to kill you, and when they are dead, they will spawn up a knight. Kill the knight in the light or dark areas, whatever you need to do to actually activate and cleanse the plate that Toland is on. Once you've done that and you've deposited the motes, you will get the ability to leave the room. Be careful because the snipers will still snipe you and all of the Taken Scions will still continue to shoot at you. However, you can use this part of the encounter to actually farm ammunition, superpower, grenades, melees, whatever you'd like before you head to the next area. As soon as you kill all of them and hop into the teleporter, it will rotate the room and you'll need to continue following Toland. Look around the room and see where Toland is. Look to see if you need light or dark motes and rinse and repeat. Kill all the enemies that are trying to kill you. Kill the snipers. As soon as they're dead, they will spawn up the Taken Knight. You kill the knights in the light or dark areas wherever you need to pick up the moats. You deposit the moats wherever Toland is and continue following him until the boss room. If you look around on the walls and you don't see Toland anywhere, it's most likely that he's on the ceiling. Now, if that happens, look at the cube in the middle of the center of the room. You'll see that some sides have symbols and some sides don't. Try to deposit on a side that has no symbol on it. At that point, go into the teleporter and move on, continuing to follow Toland until you get to the boss room. Once you get to the boss room, there will be two Taken Centurion bosses you'll need to knock out, but they are truly pushovers. They are not difficult to kill at all as long as you knock them out before they stomp. If you want to run Concussive Dampener at this part too, that will be A-OK, -okay, but you could always just block with a sword as well. Kill them and you're done with this encounter. You can either get the Last Breath Auto Rifle, the Swift Verdict Sidearm, or Arm Pieces of Gear for any of your characters from this chest. 
Now, what I told you is a very watered down, simplified version of how this works. If you actually want to know the true mechanics, stick around. Otherwise, click the timestamp here. All right. In this encounter, you can notice that every single side of the room has a distinct shape and format. You see up there, that's the boss room. What you are doing in this encounter is trying to clear every single room and marking the cube that is in the center of the room with a circular Trials of the Nine symbol. So you see that I actually collected Tolan from there and there was a symbol put on the box. That's actually what you're doing. So whenever you follow Toland and collect him and cleanse him on a plate, he's going to add a symbol to the cube that is in the middle of the room. Most people didn't even know about that. A lot of times I mention that to people and they don't even realize that there are symbols being marked on the cube as you progress through it. And that's where the fundamental misunderstanding comes from, from the community. And it really stems from what to do when Tolan is on the ceiling. Let's show you the mechanic in real time. This is the first room that we're in and we've cleared the spot where Toland is marked. So on this side of the cube to that plate. For the purposes of this part of the video, Dark Flame helped me out. So this isn't solo, but this is just to explain the mechanics. Thanks to Dark for helping me test this. We've cleared that side of the plate. And when we look up at the cube now that we've entered this room, you will see that a circular symbol appears. That's actually what happens. So now that we're in this room, as we look around at the walls, we can see that Toland is not there and he is on the ceiling. So if Toland is on the ceiling, what I told you to do is look at the cube and see where there is no symbol and deposit there. But there is an additional detail we need to cover now that we understand how the encounter truly works. As I look at the cube in the middle of a room, I'm going to see that I don't want to deposit there because that is an area where I've already been. I can deposit here, but see that room over there with the long thin columns that's the boss side if you deposit on that side even though there's no symbol you'll have to do an additional rotation because no matter what you're going to have to do the boss room again so if you want to minimize how many times you rotate you want to make sure that you deposit if toland is on the ceiling any side that's not the boss room and any side where you see the cube has no symbol so in this case, I'm not going to deposit on that right side. I'm not going to deposit on the boss. I'm going to deposit anywhere else. We did a ton of testing on this, including actually jumping up to the very top so we could actually look at the cubes as we did this. This is actually how this works. So you see there's the symbol here, the symbol here, right here is a plate that I've cleared. That's where we're heading to next. You can see the boss side is here and you can see that there's no symbol there. If I jump up to the very top, you'll actually see that there's a marking on the top of the cube as well. Now that you know that, what's the moral of the story? What I said earlier holds true. Follow Toland around the room and deposit there. If he's on the ceiling, look to see on the cube in the middle of the room where there is no symbol. On top of that, make sure you don't deposit at the boss room. Remember, the boss room looks like this. It's got those long, thin columns on that. As long as you do that, you are in good shape. Again, I just wanted to make sure that there were no misunderstandings, as there have been plenty in the comment section of my videos and on Reddit. If you deposit on the wrong side, it's not a big deal. It just means you're going to have to rotate the room more. It's not going to fail the encounter, but it may make your solo flawless runs go a lot longer. And understanding that part is actually really important. Okay, Internet, are we good? Glad we could clear that up. As soon as we get done with that encounter, we move on outside and we're going to be following the Kel Echo off to the right hand side where we leave the hexahedron room. If you need to, you can go get the chest in the wasteland if you have not gotten that. I have seen some people say you could get the chest twice. I have tried it multiple times and I have never been able to duplicate it before, but your results might vary. As soon as you go through this area here, you're going to go into the ribbon road area. If you are on a Titan and you want to stay alive and be careful about not falling off anywhere, you can put lion rampants and a sword on as well. So there are three different ribbons that you can ride down on a sparrow or walk down, but there also are going to be a couple of snipers on platforms. You can also jump on those platforms if you wish and climb down slowly, especially on a solo flawless run that might make it a little bit easier for some of you. Just take your time and you're good. So there are some of the platforms that you can see off in the distance. The great thing about this is that you can go as fast or as slow as you want to. Essentially, all you want to do is get down to the end of the ribbon road so that you can be sucked into the big, large structure there off in the distance. 
There is an additional secret chest in this area in the structure right before the final plate. You'll see that there is going to be a hole off to the right hand side. If you follow that path that you see here on screen, you'll actually make your way to a secret chest. If you jump across the gap and go up the stairs, the secret chest will be right there and it will give you any gear that you've previously earned in the Prophecy Dungeon. Go back on up to that area there and you will see a plate plus a couple of enemies. Now that area, you can actually see that it will suck some of the enemies forward and it will also pull you forward into the large structure, but sometimes it won't work right away. I would say just be careful, hop on and off your sparrow, and if you're worried about dying, just kill the enemies before you hop down to that plate and you'll be good to go. If you'd like, you can skip the enemies that are here in this location. You don't actually have to fight them, but if you continue on, you'll make your way to the final boss room. All right, let's show you my build before we go in and do this. As always, I'm going to build everything around having charged with light and high energy fire mods on. But for the exotic, I'm going to be using Dune Marchers to have faster sprinting, but also to chain melee damage together. It's going to be great in clearing ads. Next up, I'm going to be using Ignition Code. That will be really good because it has blinding grenades. It will take out the ogre very easily and blind any enemies that are trying to kill me. As usual, I'm going to be using my Trinity Ghoul like I did in the first encounter to clear ads that I don't kill with the Dune Marchers and the Chaining the Energy, and of course my Falling Guillotine in case if I need to kill any knights really quickly and pick up their moats. I'm going to be using the Top Tree Sentinel Titan for the entire portion of this encounter. Now the reason I'm doing it mainly is so that when I'm at the boss and I can do full damage, I want to be able to use Ward of Dawn and have weapon damage increased for a significant portion of time. In addition, I can get Defensive Strike to proc, which means that if I kill an enemy with a melee ability, it will create an overshield around me. Final Blows will grant melee energy when the overshield is active, and pairing that with Dune Marchers is going to be really, really strong. In addition, when I have that overshield, it will increase the melee damage and increase reload speed, which will be really good. And of course, we've got a health regeneration piece here with Rallying Force. Melee kills restore health for you and your nearby allies. For the second part of the encounter, I'm actually going to switch off my Trinity Ghoul to any kind of a submachine gun, and then I'm going to go to my Long Shadow Sniper Rifle as well as Sleeper Simulant. Now, for those people who are concerned about getting enough ammo for Sleeper Simulant, what you can do when you are running the initial part of the Kel Echo encounter is have your sword on, but instead of running Fusion Rifle Finder, turn on sword ammo finder that will actually help you find more ammo bricks especially heavy ammo and then before you pick them up change to your sleeper simulant before you go in and do boss damage here is the final encounter the kel echo you're going to be in a pyramid shaped room with three kel echoes that are going to be shooting at you the only way you can get rid of them is to cleanse the three sides all around you with the light or dark columns respectively so there will be a bunch of Taken Knights and Scions trying to kill you here in this area. Now you can see how strong this build is with Dune Marchers. I was able to take out all of those Taken Scions with a single punch and get an Overshield, which is really, really strong. The other thing that's nice about this build is that if you want to or you get in trouble, you can pop a bubble real quick, catch your breath, and have an Overshield, and sometimes even draw those Knights into a battle in a place where you'd like to. As always, when you use the moats to clear a corner, a blighted ogre will spawn up and try to kill you. Again, a very easy way to take care of him is to use a grenade launcher. Right here is another great example of using dune marchers to get your health back as well as clear a lot of enemies. Right there, took out all of those enemies. All you have to do is make sure that you maintain your punch. Now, right here, you can see that they all stopped firing at me. Blinding grenades is a really, really solid in this portion of the encounter. Rinse and repeat, clear the room, make sure that you've cleared all the enemies, and grab the moats that you need to clear all the corners. Here's another good example of the blinding grenade launcher working really well for me. Right here, I can shoot this around the corner, and they're blinded. They can't do anything. At this portion, since I decided to use my shield earlier in the encounter, I'm just building up super energy and getting ammo. So right here, I've cleared all the corners, and there's just ads to kill. See right here all this ammo that's spawning up? A perfect example to make sure that I've got enough ammo for my sleeper simulant. What I'll do is once they're all dead, I'll take a second, optimize my build for what I want to do next. I want to make sure that I put on particle deconstruction on my mark as well for my titan. 
you can see I'm all switched over. I'm going to switch to Rally Barricade as well to help my reload speed. And at this portion, I've got tons of shots of Sniper Rifle, Sleeper Simulant, and I'm ready with my Super. Now, I do this area a little bit differently than other people, especially farming guides for doing it with a group. But as a solo player, you need to make sure that you maximize your survivability and your damage. So here, I'm just going to use my sniper rifle, hit a couple of shots on the boss, and also take care of any of the snipers that pop up. Now, this is good because I'm going to build up my charge with light and also get my life back just in case if someone is trying to kill me or I get hit by some snipers or the boss attacks me. And I'm going to stay in front of the boss instead of being behind him. I like this because I get to control the encounters. Instead of me chasing him, he's chasing me and I can get in front of any of the snipers or any of the enemies that might try to kill me. This is really good, especially if you're trying to solo flawless this and you're trying to make sure that you stay alive in a high stress situation. At this portion, I can continue just using my sniper rifle. And now that he teleports to this position, I'm going to take care of these two snipers. Now, you do need to be careful you don't get too far away from the boss. You can see that Dark Entropy, which is a thing that will kill you if you're too far away from the boss, will build up if you're not within his aura. You can see that there's like a white aura around him. At this point here, I can stand just a little bit far away here and engage with the boss and do some insane damage. I've got the bubble right next to me, which will give me weapons of light. I can put up a rally barricade right here, and I can do tons of damage to the boss. Now, even if you get teleported, like right there, you still have weapons of light. And now that you've killed most of the snipers, you have a clear firing lane where he can't even damage you if you get teleported. As always, you want to watch out for that dark entropy, but now that he's teleported away, we are still good to go. Now, at this point, I'm going to change my gear back to everything that I needed for the first phase. That's Falling Guillotine, the Ignition Code, Trinity Ghoul, make sure that I have Passive Guard on my class item, and then also a Normal Shield. In addition, you can go look around for ammo from the snipers that you kill in this boss damage area. But as soon as you go through this pyramid right here, it will take you to another one of the separate rooms. Just like in the hexahedron encounter, this room rotates, but the process is the same. I find that the most important thing is that as soon as you spawn into a new room, make sure you figure out which side of the room you want to clear first and stay alive. This is probably the hardest part of the encounter as this room is going to be full of enemies that are going to try and kill you, especially those ogres and those knights can be very, very deadly. If you need to, just use your blinding grenade launcher to survive a little bit, punch something as a true titan would, use those dune marchers to chain that damage around, find a safe spot, and do some massive damage. As always, be careful not to stand too close to the Kel Echoes in this location as they can stomp you and do massive damage to you. Take your time and just clear the areas that you need to, get your abilities back as soon as you can, get some sword ammo, and then make sure that you're using Dune Marchers and Trinity Ghoul to knock out any of the Taken Scions as they will do massive damage to you if you allow them to get out of control. Every time you clear the room, you get more chances to do damage to the boss. The most important thing I would say to anyone who's struggling with this is to prioritize your positioning and your survivability. Always be thinking about where you're going to next and then making sure you use your abilities, your overshields, your dune marchers, whatever, to stay alive. If you need to do another rotation, it's not the end of the world. If you follow all these strategies, you will be able to kill the Kel Echo and get a solo or solo flawless run in Season of the Lost on a Titan. When you kill the boss, you will instantly get a pinnacle piece of gear, but from the chest that comes from the next room, you can get a helm, chest, class item, or a chance at the sudden death shotgun or the darkest before pulse rifle. All right, everybody, that is all three classes doing prophecy in Season of the Lost. If you didn't catch those other videos, look down in the description box below. It will be there. As always, if you like something in the video, a positive rating is greatly appreciated. Make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications for more Destiny 2 guides. As always, check out my stream over at twitch.tv slash manodestra if you need more help and come join a great community down in our Discord. The link for that is down in the description box below. Good hunting, Guardians. I will see you next time in the universe of Destiny.